true, all of us used to be one on the same vibration. The best way to explain it? We'd have to go either back in time or back to the future. To the starting point of time, zero, where all the axes meet. This is actually the death and the rebirth of consciousness. I had my eyes closed, my ignorance was bliss But, but then it died slow as I replaced it with my fist Now, now, now I'd rather know and rise from this abyss Now that I'm aware that I'm infinite consciousness I had my eyes closed, ignorance was bliss Now I'm being followed for spreading these messages The threats might be hollow, my response serious I reject rain man and umbrellas still get wet I had my eyes closed hey, hey, hey. huge controversy on whether we do live on this spinning ball or a flat plane, I'm here to present an alternate theory, kind of mixing both. Ready? At first, out of the void, the nothingness, the timeless, spaceless, and matterless abyss, chaos finally met order. It is intelligent, it is beautiful, it is everything and nothing, it is all at once, it is syncretized. I call it infinite consciousness. One day it decided to finally create a womb for itself, where it can build a home to create an experience within itself. So the Holy Trinity was designed, executed, and it's perfect. This is essentially the birth of consciousness. In the center is absolute consciousness, where everything overlaps. Birth, life, death, creation, sustenance, and destruction. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Everything is divided into threes, hence the 33 Point three 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 etc number being so popular and important in our society it's also worth noting this is where i believe the first sine wave was ever created that is the breath the in the out the up the down the left right etc this is life consciousness cycles repetition patterns with its intelligence, the Holy Trinity creates its home, its womb, the first of five rings. This is the seed of life, where everything starts. While slowly transitioning from chaos to order, the Trinity divided itself into three portions. Just like on a magnet, you have red and blue, positive and negative. Here we have birth, which is up top, Polaris, the highest star. In the middle we have life, which is green. And on the bottom we have death, which is red, negative, polarity. This is also why we have RGB in our color codes. I'll actually explain that one in a bit more detail a little later, because it is important. Next, the Trinity started to stir its creation, essentially creating our cosmic vortex, the universal highway, and our atmosphere generator, all basically connecting us to the masterverse, so they say. Up top, this also creates the mainframe that powers it all. This gives us our energy, our weather, our flow of airs, waters, currents, all spinning clockwise, oscillating, and giving us our gases, gravities, densities, buoyancies, turbulence, etc. The upper part of the orb 
is known as the land of the gods. This is where the star of stars, the director of everything, sits. Under him, Omega, Andromeda, and the Milky Way, all giving birth to the first breath by Neptune and Uranus, giving it its first oscillation. This is what mixes everything. This is what creates our actual clockwise spin. We know it as the vortex, the cosmic vortex, or the black hole. Next, we have our actual Earth, built in three parts as well, both above and below. Like they say, as above, so below. So we have three-part pyramid here, and each level of these pyramids are our lands. So we have the crust, the mantle, inner core, and outer core. This is also what gives us our four elements of life. Air, earth, water, fire. Also, now that you have this viewpoint, you can see that there is such thing as space. However, it's not to go to other planets up there. It's to go to outer lands beyond our perimeter. Why can't we go to the perimeters? This is why, right here. These are called toroidal fields. You guys know them as the Van Allen belts. There are five toroidal fields that separate the lands and give each its own ecosystem, its own sun and moon, and give each its own atmosphere and rotate and oscillate to give the earth its breathing system. Okay, this allows the whole orb to breathe in and out. And these toroidal fields protect each perimeter, or we can call them districts. So we are on the center one, and you'll see four here with a tiny one in the center center of our Earth, which is the North Pole. Okay, there is an actual polar field there. There is actual energy there. Compasses get pulled there. So let's take a closer look. These electromagnetic fields all oscillate at different speeds. So if we go by this theory, then the sun is traveling around us at around a thousand miles an hour. And the other stars are also traveling in their respective speeds in their own perimeters. The second perimeter with Mars is 67,000 miles an hour. And the outer perimeter is close to half a million miles an hour. So all of these have their own oscillations, both the actual rings and the actual planets or sun and moons within them. Each of these lands, each of these rings has four atmospheres to go along with it. And that is the troposphere on the bottom part, the stratosphere just above us, the mesosphere, and then the thermosphere. And again, going back to the vortex that spins from above and below is what gives all of these their oscillations. We're gonna talk more about oscillations a little later because they are very, very important. Okay, so now let's break down the planets. Each land has its own sun and moon. Mercury, which is the very center of centers of everything in the North Pole, is both a sun and moon, okay? It is both, therefore, we're not counting it here. We're saying there's three suns and three moons, man and woman, left and right, positive, negative. Each land has its own ecosystem. This is where the theory of extraterrestrials or extra terrain, extra land, come from. The outer outer ring may also be where dinosaurs, creatures, aliens, again, a different ecosystem, different light sources, colors, air, breath, everything is different. So when they say they're trying to explore outer space, it doesn't really mean up because those are illuminaries, those are stars, those cannot be landed on. <laughs> They mean outer lands beyond the perimeters known as the South Pole or the Antarctic.
You guys have taken in a lot of data. Congrats for sticking around this long. Let's quickly recap. We have the Holy Trinity creating the womb. Then the Holy Trinity separates into positive, neutrality, and negative. Then a vortex is created. Then a rock is created for our lands. Then our toroidal fields are created to create cycles and to create breath and to create oscillations. Then suns and moons are created and they also have their own oscillations and they are all respective to their own lands. So let's break down oscillations some more. Here we simply see a sun and a moon going around in a circle. And here we see three going around in circles. Now some are oscillating faster than others, but they're all generally going in a circle. And they are now going to oscillate in a lot of different ways as well. Here you see the original oscillation to the different types of patterns you can create while doing your big oscillation. So this is a double oscillation. And here you can see that all the planets are also moving up and down over their oscillations as well. So we have a big oscillation, and then a pattern within that as a secondary oscillation, then we're moving up and down as a third oscillation, and they're changing patterns over time and could be adding and removing other oscillations, who really knows? You can also create different types of oscillations based on the different wave type. We are known as a sine wave, everything is fluid. There are also sawtooth, triangle, and square wave types. This is also used a lot in music production, we'll go into that a little bit more later too. But you can see that these patterns create beautiful shapes and they also depict our time, our seasons, our summers, winters, when the planets breathing, opening and closing, that gives us all of our different oscillations. These oscillations also explain the various lunar and solar eclipses. Think about it. In certain oscillations, the sun will be going in front of the moon. In other oscillations, the sun will be going behind the moon, or vice versa. And that probably happens with all the planets. That's why sometimes you'll see people ask, why do I see two suns or three moons or whatever, the various variations and phenomena that we see. Generationally, these patterns have been tracked to some degree. If you actually pause the video as these are going around in their circles, you'll start to create amazing shapes. And if you connect all the planets and the dots, so to speak, you'll see where the yin yang symbol comes from, the positive negatives come from, color theory comes from, frequencies come from, everything basically comes from these oscillations. It is a beautiful system of design they say the fallen angels or the illuminated ones have had this knowledge, which I'm presenting to you today as a simple theory, but there's probably some truths to some of this, uh, have had it for a long time and it has been perverted and distorted over time. Now, just as a side note, wouldn't it be a great story to tell the populace that you cannot get off this plane, this planet, plane, because there's just infinite time and space outside of this plane. We only have access to the inner part. It is a special part of all this because it is the center and we have access to the North Pole, which is where ascension happens. And I do think we are in a special time. It's not just, let's prove the earth is flat. What's beyond that? So what if it is? Well, what might be outside those perimeters? Maybe there are things we need to protect ourselves from. And or maybe it is just a bunch of land we cannot get to. But every country, every government would love to, to chop it up, carve it up, because there's so many precious resources out there, potentially. Okay, so let's look at oscillations and frequencies in music now. I've been doing music production for a very long time, on top of doing art, digital media, video. I've gone through everything to do with art at a fundamental level in various gifted schools and whatnot. My creative side is, is my passion, my labor of love, and I believe I've been given these beautiful talents and skills to share beautiful information like this. And 
potentially help you guys ascend or at least become illuminated and understand and have knowledge in the beautiful, engaging presentation. Here we have frequencies with music and layering music and giving you visuals for those frequencies. You can see that certain notes sit in the lower frequencies and certain notes sit in the higher frequencies. But here you can see layers of audio overlapping each other and creating beautiful waves as well. And when you layer things properly, you create harmonics, natural harmonics. And that's when the oscillations become beautiful visuals as well. So everything is everything. And this is another example of that. But when it comes to music and when it comes to artists hitting certain notes and singing certain melodies or priests chanting or other melodic structures or cording or layering of your voice or an instrument. Again, you get beautiful harmonics. So when we play something in the higher octaves, it sounds angelic. When we play something in the lower octaves, it sounds demon-like. If we take this one step further and add a visual and sound effects, you can definitely see how you can make someone uncomfortable or anxious by design. Now while watching this, think of your daily routine and how you oscillate and what you eat and what type of frequencies you take in, people you talk to, entertainment you take in, etc. You'll be surprised at how much negative energy you probably take in on a daily basis and don't even know it. artist is singing and they're off key you can just tell you can sense it you know the harmonics are off or when someone's showing you a spoofy video you can tell it's fake or when a journalist is spoofing a story you can tell they're faking it this is because the harmonics are off and your bullshit radar is basically detecting it but when you do it through things like entertainment and movies and music and comedy where there's a bit of truth to every joke you play a very fine line of the types of perceptions you're presented with your whole life. So of course me showing you this stuff is probably making you reject it instinctively because your whole life you've been told we're living on a ball that's spinning in outer space in infinity. And in part, some of that might be true. Singularity could be the Big Bang. Our whole universe might well be flying through infinite void. But our actual land that we live on well, I'll let you be the judge. Or you've ended up on this video because you've already discovered your own truth. So what I'm trying to say, when you do listen to frequencies, watch movies, do your day-to-day, -day, take in 5,000 logos, 400 cents, 300 people's eye contact and energies overlapping yours, think about what your purpose in this life is. Because my goal is to help you guys Ascend to a higher state of consciousness, become illuminated, and you too are nothing but a big oscillation machine. When you breathe in and out, that's oscillating. When you walk, your whole body is oscillating. When you sleep, you're going through a cycle. Everything about us is oscillating, and you should be oscillating to your full potential in this beautiful universe. Toroidal fields is where the firmament sits. This is where all the stars are attached and fixated as they do their oscillation as well. This firmament is what prevents us from going up 
In fact, there's footage online of rockets being sent up by independent teams, and you can clearly see it hit something up there before coming back down. Now, if you look up Operation Fishbowl and Operation High Jump, you'll come across some interesting information regarding the efforts that the governments have put in to try to get through the firmament. Anyway, that is how the star system works. Now the top two planets, Neptune and Uranus, are, I believe, also just above the firmament. They are what give the initial spin to the vortex. These two are also known as exoplanets, and that is because they are on the exterior of the toroidal fields and outside of the three suns and moons system. And again, this is what gives all the differentiation to all the oscillations of everything else under it. So we've covered a lot of the top half because that is our home and we don't really know what's on the bottom. But based on the same research sources, the bottom is very much like the top, except with water. There are also three levels below us that mimic what we have above. And then there's also a firmament on the very bottom, just above Pluto. Again, instead of air, it's water, and it's known as the Great Deep. The five toroidal fields operate down here to cycle the water in its respective cycles as well. And frankly, who knows what kind of life forms may be down there or what may be down there. But this is known in our literature as hell. Interesting, huh? So how does religion tie into all this? Let me try to explain. And this is just my opinion. I believe all the holy books were simply metaphorical stories to explain exactly what I just showed you. I don't believe there were actual people. I believe they were depicting everything you see here and all the variables were given their own characters. I'm going to stick to the Bible here just to give you guys a couple random examples and then please refer to any of it for yourselves to see if you can pinpoint the metaphor. When they say Jesus died on the cross, that is a metaphor for Jesus is Christ. Christ represents consciousness. Consciousness died on the cross. The cross is the crux, again, the cross section, the middle point of middle points. And if we look at the cross in a 3D format, you'll notice it's not a plus symbol. The center horizontal piece is moved up because on the universe, we are not in the center of centers. We are up a little bit on that third plane, right? So when consciousness died at the cross section of our universe, that is the North Pole. And when they say follow the North Star, that is Polaris. And the birth of Jesus is also under the North Star. The very center of the first toroidal field inside is known as the Garden of Eden. That is a holy place. That is a spiritual place. So when Christ was crucified, consciousness ascended into the heavens through the moons because you come in through the suns and you leave through the moons, ascended into heaven, and three days later was reborn. Again, a metaphor for reincarnation or your next cycle, your next life. This is where past lives, future lives, we are our own ancestors, etc. comes from as well. Also, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit derives from this too. Pretty much every single thing you see in the holy books, it's a story and a metaphor to explain one of these variables in this beautiful universe. Hey, I'm just putting forth theories. I'm not trying to push any religion onto anybody, nor am I religious. But I do believe that people in ancient times simply had this knowledge and again, told it to us in story form format, or in book format, or in holy book format. I thought a lot about how to close this out, because I've given you a lot of intel, and some of you are probably laughing, while others have been here before, and others are even farther along in the research than I am. Some of you are probably asking, where did you get all this info? 
are you just making this shit up or is this actually sourced material or well it's a mix of ancient literature cosmology science and putting various random puzzle pieces together for a long time again it's called the norb theory because it's just that i don't believe in this definitively either i just think it's a lot more plausible than what we're currently told and as i close this out i'm going to show you guys some screen caps of others that have taken this theory before me in their own ways and presented it i'm also going to leave links in the description to the stuff that influenced me at least some of it that breaks some of this down and gives it even more context so does it really matter if the earth is flat or not not really at least not for those that already don't believe a lot of what we're told and taught and there's a lot of us and more awakening every day but i guess some of the fears would be that the religions would quickly claim they had the right story there is a creator something designed this thing be it a simulation of a simulation or a great designer a god a greater being and not to mention they'd have to finally fess up that they've been lying this whole time and give us full disclosure, which may well happen. It's actually an exciting time as more people wake up. There's a lot to explore. There's a lot to learn. And it's amazing to finally realize we don't know that much about ourselves or where we live, at least not most of us. I always thought there must be some order. It's not just all chaos and random. And this was my final missing link to that thinking. There very well may be other life forms out there, aliens or whatever but they're depicted very negatively, low frequencies, ugly, creatures. They may be way ahead of us and looking at us as the aliens or the pests, the destructive species that can't even get into their own harmony. Keep them away from us, could be what they're saying. Never really know. So what's after this? Well, they say if you lived out your karma properly, you ascend. If not, you're doing this again. Is there gonna be a part two? Who knows? Hopefully, all of us will be actually living it instead of watching it on your screens. They have nations divided. They have religions divided. They have demographics divided. They have age groups divided. And now they're going after the biggest, the gender war. Whether we're going to space or we're going to the outer limits, I still believe the purpose of life is to be good versus evil. I still believe I've made it to where I've made it to in life because I've challenged everything and I've not been definitive with my thinking, especially when it comes to belief systems, politics, the way I oscillate in this lifetime, and how I spend my time and resources and efforts to try to achieve my goals. As we go through this transitioning, this big mass awakening, I'm sure some of you can already feel it and sense it. More and more of you guys are going to come to your own truths faster and faster than ever before. So if anything, I'd love for you guys to at least keep an open mind to this and anything that is presented in front of you as fact and definitive. If you can't touch it yourself, explore it yourself, see it yourself, not just on a television screen, not just through news, not just through an organization, be it government or not, then don't just blindly believe it just because you've been told something your whole life doesn't make it true. But do your own research. And the five most important words that I don't think they want me telling you, they're simple. All you need is love. Sun is Sunday, Moon is Monday, Mars is Tuesday, Mercury, the center, is Wednesday, Jupiter is Thursday, Venus is Friday, Saturn is Saturday. We have a pretty interesting shape here. I decided to keep going and connecting the rest of the planets as they are all aligned. I started noticing really cool patterns 
of perspective and all kinds of shapes, stars, triangles, rectangles, and pretty evenly split pieces. Although the image itself is on a bit of a perspective angled downwards and a little to the right. So this won't come up perfectly and I'm simply in Photoshop using the shift command with the uh, pencil tool to connect one point to the next. So it's all kind of rough, it's not perfect. However, you still get the idea. I decided to keep going and connect the upper parts as well, starting with Polaris, Singularity, and I got even more perspective. Now I'm starting to see pyramids, three dimensions. And I started to think about some of our structures and some of our stories and the story of Babel, where they built the tower to try to get up there. And Polaris decided, nope, we're going to flood everything. You guys got to start over. You can't cheat the system to try to get up and ascend faster. And I started to look at some of the other pyramids and noticed the three big ones. It's important because the tallest is always Polaris. The second tallest is always a sun. And the third is always a moon. So the suns are always a little higher than the moons. Anyway, just thought this was kind of interesting as I start overlaying some of the images. Okay, so I start to go even higher now and connect the midpoint, the firmament, well, the midpoint up there. And I get even more perspective, perhaps even more dimensions. And again, as they are spinning and oscillating, multiple directions at the same time and changing that directional pattern we go through different cycles of time we go through different cycles of energy we go through different cycles of consciousness then i started to get a little sinister and look for logos that might fit and came upon this again just theorizing just having some fun and being creative seeing what i could come up with and as I get each new puzzle piece and go, aha, something interesting just happened. Let's add this to it. Let's add that to it. Um, this is just me, again, theorizing, being creative on perhaps why the chevron vector symbol is so important because it's in everyday use all around us in all our energies and all our logos. This is definitely one of my biggest masterpieces as far as compiling a bunch of info and presenting it with wicked graphics my own music, Foley, 3D from scratch, pretty much everything you see here. And I'm really proud of this thing. So please feel free to share it, critique it, drop your comments below. If there's any corrections to be made, feel free to drop those too. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. I had my eyes closed, my ignorance was bliss But, but then it died slow as I replaced it with my fist Now, now, now I'd rather know and rise from this abyss Now, now that I'm aware that I'm infinite consciousness I had my eyes closed, ignorance was bliss Now I'm being followed for spreading these messages The threats might be hollow, my response is serious I reject Rain Man and the brothers still get wet I had my eyes closed hey, hey.
First and foremost, a huge thank you to everybody, the universe. I had no idea what kind of reception this would get. I didn't know it would cause such a fuss and go a little viral and get the attention it did. So thank you to everyone. I'm doing this video in two parts. First, a chapter on perception and perspective, just things I noticed as I was developing the project. And second, all the renders that I did, plus new ones I'm posting and I'm allowing you guys under a Creative Commons license to reuse them to create your future content if you'd like. I'm noticing people uh, mirror the video and re-upload it and not monetize it. I really appreciate that and even linking back to me. Really appreciate that. Feel free to keep doing it. So on top of that, I'm releasing these renders and looping them twice so you guys can find loop points of your own and loop them more if you want or just use them as they are and create more content from them and even monetize that content. Just um, again, feel free to link back to me as the source. And I'm doing this as a gift to the community to take these renders and republish them and help get the message out. It seems really cool that there's been like a barrier of light surrounding this topic lately. And anyone that comes out with information or presentations, I won't lie, I was expecting an 80% hate, 20% love response because it's such an abstract theory for some, for most, especially new people to this that have knee-jerk reactions and insults and ad hominem, which is cool. I embrace it all, but it's actually the other way around. It's 80% love, 20% hate, and a lot of, hmm, interesting, I'll ponder this, or a lot of, I'm on the fence now. You almost got me convinced. Not yet, but almost. A lot of people are having their mind blown by this video in a lot of ways because it ties so much together. So again, a huge shout out, and in this video, I'm just going to be relaxed, be myself, and walk you guys through some cool things I noticed about my own project as I was developing it and thought, hmm, I'm going to visualize this and explain it in a little more detail in future videos. So this is that next video. So again, thank you so much for the responses. Another cool thing I noticed is people from pretty much every walk of life and every religion are coming to this and saying, hey, you know what? My holy book says such and such, which overlaps with your theory. And my holy book says this and that, which overlaps with your theory. And it's actually bringing people together instead of dividing people further and causing a bunch of religious, political arguments. It's actually making people come together and have an open-ended conversation. Of course, you should be critical of this. Of course, you should question it and your own reality and maybe throw an insult just to validate your own current beliefs. I get it. But do approach this topic openly. And again, don't be definitive in this or your own belief. Just be open-minded because you're a human. You're a sponge. You're influenced easily. And like they say, it's really easy to fool someone. It's really hard to convince someone that they've been fooled. Okay, let's go. I decided to do this because as funny as it is for people that are new to the flat plane versus planet concept, when you discover this knowledge and you go deeper and deeper into the knowledge base then you go back to looking at how our solar system is explained to us i'm trying to do that here and it's almost like forcing yourself to believe in santa claus again so there's just no going back but for sake of argument and for my own humor and yours i'd like to rebuild and remodel this the way we're presented our reality and then put them side by side to what the flat plane and the norb theory the orb theory is both are incredible and i'll actually start with the moon the moon never shows us its backside it only rotates this way never shows us the backside of it never rotates this way it only shows us that top Okay, I'm cutting this into the video after I've already edited it, so pardon the background being different, but I had to pause on the moon portion and go back to it because the theory is that the reason we don't see the back of the moon and it never shows us its backside is because there is no backside and apparently it's actually flat. And really, really, we wouldn't know. And you'll understand why a little bit later in this video when I go over perception and perspective. But for all we know, that is what's happening. And it only rotates this way, right? Then if you take that theory and you think of the rest of the planets, maybe they're all like that, just disks. 
faced towards us, never spinning in any direction but that. These other planets, if you look at actual footage from telescopes and crazy zooms, you never really see a full picture. They always look watery. They always look like just lights, illuminating lights, flashing, blinking, twinkling. So, food for thought. Okay, let's go back. Now I'm also going to make it rotate around the Earth. Okay, so we have the moon going around the Earth and it's doing its x-axis rotation as it goes around once. And apparently the moon is 237,000 miles, I believe it is, away from us. So now I'm going to go to the Earth group. Okay, just to give, show you guys what's happened so far. Now we have the Earth spinning, the cloud spinning a bit faster just to give us some realism and the moon going around us. We're not going to animate the other planets either because it's going to start looking really ridiculous actually. But let's do one step further now where we got to zoom back out 93 million miles away. <laughs> All right, so now the Earth is flying around the sun at I believe it's 67,000 miles an hour. So, we have something like this. The moon's rotating around us. We are rotating a thousand miles an hour. Both the moon and Earth are rotating around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. <laughs> Again, we're on the surface, we're not flying off because gravity holds us down apparently, right? Also, it just so happens that within the last 50 years, thanks to this beautiful technology, we have discovered that these asteroid fields out there are a danger to us. They never have been in the last millions and millions of years of this apparent planet's existence while it's doing the same fly through infinity with never changing scenery. But now, we can actually tell that an asteroid might be on its way to Earth and we have to build a defense system to protect ourselves from it. Just now, in the last 50 years. Never before, but just now, because we have the technology to apparently view it, right? So let's go one step further. We're going to take these asteroid belts and also animate them and make sure that they're causing a potential danger, right? Causing a potential danger. We're spinning, baby! We're spinning! Everything's spinning! And somehow we're just not feeling it. And we can't measure it. And we can't reproduce it. And we can't see the actual curvature of that ball unless we're looking through uh, lenses and funny tricks. So, here it is. Without animating the rest of it just yet, I'm going to animate a few more things. But you'll notice the camera's easing in and out when it's doing its loop. Right around here, it stops and then picks up again. That's not realistic. So I'm just going to spend a moment and make sure that I have everything interpolating properly. We haven't even touched oscillations. This just goes in a perfect loop. Doesn't go up, doesn't go down, doesn't go further out, doesn't go further in. They're not telling us a lot even in this model, just to make it make more sense. All right, so give me a second here. There we go. Now it should be looping seamlessly without stopping or easing in or easing out. And this is just forever. Now again, oscillations should matter and should be included in this. So in order for me to oscillate this, the Earth would have to be moving up and down as it's going around and also have to be going in and out, doing its spiral to change seasons and to change uh, all our weather patterns and whatnot. So we're not gonna go that far with this. I'm just gonna take this one step further now though take this to a top view zoom out a little bit more so you guys can get a better view 93 million miles away nanu nanu okay so we're flying 24,000 miles and we're going around the Sun 67,000 miles now we got to do this too. the Sun and all of this is spinning around as well at half a million miles an hour so everything is spinning 
while we're spinning, while the moon's spinning around us. And now on top of that, half a million miles an hour, the next figure is literally everything flying through infinity in the void at whatever million, million, millions of miles per hour that is. I forget that figure. Okay, this is parallaxing. Some stars are closer, some stars are farther away. The ones that are closer are going to fly by faster than us, than the ones farther away. The ones farther, farther, really far away, barely move. This is parallaxing. This is when you know you're in a 3D environment, going through space, going through things. But we never see this, and the first star is so far away, it just always looks like this. Always. With a center point, right there if we're focused on Polaris. It would be right there. And a time-lapse video would show perfect trails the same way every single night. No parallaxing. Never flying through actual space. Never observable anyway. Let's do a little test now, shall we? Out of these two spheres, which one is bigger? Which one is smaller? Or are they both the same size? This has to do with perspective. Okay, I'm going to switch this to a double viewport. I'm going to switch this to perspective view. Look at the difference in sizes. This one is simply in the foreground. This one is way in the background, but it's huge. At least five times bigger than this one. If I didn't show you this, though, you would still see them as being the same size. Maybe even this one being bigger, which in reality it is five times smaller. All right, let's play again. This time there's three. Which one of these is smallest to biggest? Or are they all the same size? And as you're getting your final answer together, think about when you look up. We don't look up too often, but when you do, how often do you see the sun? How bright can you claim it always is versus does it always stay the same brightness, the same distance from us? Is it oscillating a little higher up, a little further in towards the center or a little further out? Is it slowing down or is it speeding up? Is it emitting the same brightness? Is it hitting the same atmospheres? Right? Perception comes into play into everything, especially your reality. Okay, the one on the left is actually the smallest and the closest to us. The one in the middle is the biggest by far, and it's way in the back. The one on the right is right along the center axis. Yet here, they all look like they're in the same plane, right? Until we start doing this. Even then, you don't really know how far or how close each of these really are in relation to each other. Take this into account when you're looking at sun sets, sun rises. It's not actually rising. It's just coming towards you and going away from you. Okay, let's keep going. Here's another one with a couple differences. Which one do you think is bigger or smaller? Which one do you think is lit up a little bit differently? I'm going to give you guys a moment. Really take a, take, take a second to, to think what else could be different. Well, even if this was a photo from space, they could still really easily trick everybody's perception into thinking it's a sphere, when in reality, it's a plane, a flat plane. With the right lighting, you can make anything look 3D. Okay. While I'm here, I'm gonna do one more thing. Okay, so to reverse this, even if we are on a flat plane, if the flat plane is actually a big circle, if we can go high enough, that horizon may very well become curved. But it's not because we are on a sphere. It's because we're still looking at that edge, which is curved towards us, right? So even right now, it's already starting to look like a globe. But it's not. It's flat. We're just looking at the very edge, which is 
circling around us. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay. Horizon. We get up to maybe here with all the technology we have. Maybe we see a bit of curvature, but it doesn't mean it's because we're seeing this. It just means we're seeing the edge, which is rounded. I also think if the other model with the orb is true, if they do have technology to go up high enough, they'll see over this edge and potentially see and expose us to the outer lands that are out there. So what better way to hide it than to wrap it all up into a nice little ball. And I'm sorry guys, I'm going to take your little ball away today. Let me show you how easy it is to take a flat map, turn it into a ball, and hide a piece of it. We've been talking about perspective and perception. We're going to switch over to this for a second. Map making. Sooner or later you guys are going to come across the map makers in your journey. And we take for granted how important people that make maps and survey the lands really are. We also take for granted what imaging and technology can do. Take a map that is flat, double it up. I'm going to add a little light here, give it our hotspot from 93 million miles away. Give it a glint so it's nice and shiny. Don't worry, that'll soften up a little later. I'm going to give it an indent so that it gives it a little bit of depth. And here's where the magic comes in. I'm going to give it a sphere effect, which basically takes my map and wraps it. And now I can take the tops and bottoms and hide land. Map makers are really, really important. Perception is really, really important. Don't forget, when we start on a flat map, surveyors survey maps that are flat based. They operate on a flat model. Half the world operates on a flat model. Society was built on a flat model. Railroads, canals, everything operates on a flat model. There's never been mathematics that have been included curvature in any of the building of our societies and civilizations of the past. Map makers are really important. We can go one step further now, drop this into another program, give it some effects, colors, hue, saturation, etc., and really warp your perception. And from when you're two, three years old, the first time you're playing with the globe, indoctrination starts young. And as an adult, convincing yourself or others that you've been fooled it's scary and even then I don't think discovering that we live on a flat plane is the scary part I think people are actually okay with that part I think the scary part is the why and once you start going down those trains of thoughts that's the part that we reject naturally and instinctively anyway map makers are really important. Now let's take a quick look at how the sun hits us. This is a representation of the sun over water in a hot spot and this reflection would be going towards you because it's water. This is only possible on a local sun not when it's 93 million miles away to have a hot spot like that. Here it's the same hot spot but it's opened up bigger, the sun is brighter, the sun's fall off is a lot different and then here it's fully blown out and then here it's minimized the average person does assume that the sun just goes in one big loop and doesn't have too much variations in how high how much it oscillates inwards and outwards how bright it shines what the fall off is etc here's another one i'm curious if your perception picks up that this is going around us in a big loop or is the sun just going from behind us, creeping up, giving us light, going over us, and then just going farther and farther away instead of actually going down? All right, we start losing brightness and it starts going out of view and it's gone. 
Is it going up and down or is it going over us? And then when it gets way out of view, it just loops around and comes back around behind us and in front of us again. You see our shadows being caused. Going back to perception, I'm wondering if you guys can tell, is this light going around the earth in a circle? Or is it just going over it in a straight line? And how would you know if perspective is everything, right? Now, the good thing is this works on both models. And the point I'm trying to make is that if something is 93 million miles away, you would never see hot spots the way we see them. Let me just get rid of all this. Here we go. Flat plane or globe, we have a hot spot. And you can see that by reflections in the waters. You can see it by the disbursement of the cloud rays coming through the skies. Here's another look quickly. Here's what I propose, which is a local sun going around us in a loop that's local and close. And here's the hot spots that it would cause. Now I'm going to switch that off and turn on what they propose. So here is a top diagonal-ish view. And here's the sun the way they're telling us it is. As far as it being huge, but really far away, there's no way it would cast hot spots the way a local sun does, right? That's a lot more realistic to what we see, especially when you actually see real footage of anything that's anywhere close to the sun. That's us. Okay, let's go back to what they're telling us for a second though. I wanna show you what we don't see. That is the sun. It shines in every direction very bright according to them what we don't see it do is hit us with the beams being spread into an actual spotlight from 93 million miles away we don't see it doing that we wouldn't sorry we wouldn't see it doing that it's impossible from 93 million miles away to cause a hot spot on one little part unless it really was a spotlight unless our Sun really is an actual spotlight and they can control it the same way I'm controlling it here. Giving it its spread, its fall off, its intensity on how bright that whole thing is going to be. And then how the hotspots will be hit and how far away seemingly this is. So to wrap up this point, I'm basically saying the average person doesn't understand 3D programs and perspectives the way 3D artists or artists in general do. Because we get top perspective as one of the first steps in art. And the average person doesn't take into account intensity, fall off, the day-to-day -day differentiation of the suns and moons, and their oscillations as they spiral inwards and back outwards over the course of the seasons. So perspective really is everything. You don't know by looking at it how far away it is from us, but you do know by ways of lighting, shadows, and understanding how lighting and perspective would work on a grand scheme when you're working with a light source coming from 93 million miles away versus a light source that is local. Now, like I mentioned before, if we are living on a flattish disc that's round, if we get high enough, we'll still see what we could perceive as a curve, right? But this isn't that, this is an actual sphere, a globe that we're looking at. And as we get higher, your perception definitely would see more and more curvature as you look downwards but not only that i think a lot of things people take for granted is when you see the far shots with cameras that can do crazy zooms and you still see things upright that doesn't make sense and let me explain why now of course this isn't a scale but you guys get the picture the further away we go from things if we're on a curved surface, then everything has to be upright according to its center point of perspective. So going outwards, going outwards, and going outwards, and going outwards, the cameras we have these days would pick this up. Let me go from this way, because the lighting's better. Okay, I didn't, I didn't actually even do this properly because these should be curved that way a bit too. If we are really sitting on this perspective, then it, they'd all be kind of like that as well. But okay, let's just skip that for a second. We would see over the course of distance 
A, only a limited field of view, and B, as we get further and further away, things would naturally seem to twist away from us, going that way, more and more and more and more, right? The further away we go from something, the further away we would start to see that. And if we can get a shot a thousand miles away, not only would it be curved like that, but it would be way below our point of view because of the curvature itself. We wouldn't be able to see around the globe. Refraction or no refraction? People seem to think refraction is simply reflection and it's not. When things refract, they distort, they invert, and it looks nothing like a typical mirage or what they tell us is a mirage. And yet, the way we look at things, everything is straight as if it's built straight up. Nothing is built going outwards in every direction. Photos would illustrate that, especially aerial shots. A huge aerial shot would show all kinds of curve on the sides of buildings. Everything would seemingly go away from you. And as you pan around, let's say we're going up in a hot air balloon and we get really high. As we panned around, everything would be skewed really far away from us. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and switch over to the renders and just have some commentary for you guys as you're watching the renders. I know a lot of the points I raised have been illustrated before, maybe even better than mine, and I'm kind of being redundant, but I just wanted to go over the few things I noticed myself while doing this project. So here we go. Here's both the previous and the newer renders looping two to three times each and I'm just gonna let some background music play and just talk openly with you guys as you're watching these so I'm gonna read something from an artist that does similar work as far as visuals go and over the years I've heard a lot of people call me a lot of things and at certain points in time I disregarded it at certain points in time it scared me at certain points in time I totally didn't believe it and as I get older I feel more and more connected to these statements. And the statements include things like, oh, you're super talented in a lot of different areas. You're gonna do great things in life. Or things like, I think you're an indigo kid or a star child, or you're multi-talented. Don't waste those talents. Make sure you do good things with those talents. Later in life, those talents are gonna mean a lot, etc." And I also got warned a lot in life be careful where you end up with your talents. Don't go into the system with your talents. Don't let the machine get a hold of your talents. Make sure you use the talents for yourself. So for a long time, I was like, screw these talents, man. They're not doing nothing for me. And it's just scaring me when I hear stuff like this. And I was a starving artist for a very long time. But sure, there are times that I get inspired, influenced, and just execute art, both visual, audio, multimedia, where afterwards I myself look at it and go, wow, did I really just create this? Where the heck did this come from? Because it's not a external influence or execution that comes from within. I don't know if channeling, uh, channeling is the right terminology. Maybe as Martin Kenny put it when we had our conversation, I'm re-remembering, I'm re-remembering or suppressed knowledge within, consciousness within being activated as we go through our awakening. So do I believe in that kind of stuff? <laughs> it's hard not to, but to be definitive about it and quantify it, it's hard to. A lot of synchronicities have been happening for me in life recently too. And even synchronicities where that are sort of retroactive and I look back at my past and certain things I've done in life, even certain art I've produced in life, years ago makes a lot of sense so in future videos i'm actually going to film and photograph the art that i've been doing from 20 and 30 years ago that weirdly resonates now and makes sense now more than ever like i'm talking abstract art alien-ish art psychedelic-ish art fractal art all of it sort of inspired by art before me or information or a sound or a scent or an image within Fellow artists, fellow creators, fellow creative types, the adults that get to be children on a day-to-day -day basis 
are the children that made it. We're the kids that made it. We're supposed to raise the vibration of the planet. And sometimes we don't know how or why and when it happens, but it does. So let me read this to you guys. Her name is Cece Kalikon or Kalichon Kalichin. Hope I got that right. One of those. She says, I have the ability to communicate with beings beyond this dimension. The imagery of my work has led me to an appreciation of the world we live in and the world beyond this world that are interconnected. The structures depicted in this artwork are combined frequencies which can be interpolated as musical, mathematical, electrical, or script descriptions. I believe these frequencies can be deciphered with some manner of code breaking. I speculate that extraterrestrial beings communicate through emissions of individual symbols from the electromagnetic technology, which is consequently understood by the conscious mind as information. She goes on to say, I feel like I'm in school and higher intelligences are instructing and teaching me. It's almost like a thesis, a work in progress. It has opened my mind to the bigger picture, which includes biology, neurology, physics, astronomy, astrophysics, theology, philosophy, spirituality, technology, anthropology, archaeology. I feel I am in school and higher intelligences are instructing and teaching me. After the work, it forces me to read and learn what they have suggested. It has awakened me to a higher consciousness and awareness. I learned to see life differently and how everything is interconnected by a mathematical order, balance, and harmony that flow within us and beyond. This art progressed in groups at a time telling me something that I was not aware of until the next body of artwork was completed. It took approximately 10 years before I realized that specific information was being relayed to me through this art making process. I think that's beautifully said. I think that encapsulates a lot of artists' purposes. Why are we talented? Why do we have these gifts? Why do we see things, hear things before they're even there and then execute them to be just as we saw or heard them? Sometimes I question my own abilities and art skills and whatnot. And while they have done a lot for me, they have freed me financially, spiritually, broken society's chains off of me. It's a confusing place to be, to have a label of being uh, an indigo kid or a star seed or a someone here to help raise the vibration of the planet. Every creative person I feel has the ability to help raise the vibration of the planet. Even in my business path in life, my biggest accomplishment to date was developing music production software, over 20 titles, and moving hundreds of thousands of units, both free and paid, to kids to help them discover music production. And now if that isn't helping raise the vibration of the planet, hundreds of thousands of kids are learning how to make music and be harmonious with sound. I feel like that's been my biggest accomplishment and purpose to date. And now, being taken from a starving artist mode to having abundance, it loops back around once you're done spending money and enjoying life as it was supposed to be enjoyed and all the rewards that come with having these talents and finding yourself. You come back around and you say, okay, I've done it all, I've, I've achieved the success thing, and now what? And you start going down, or I started going down a spiritual journey. Now what? What else can I do with these talents and skills? What's my next purpose now that I've accomplished this thing of freeing myself and of sharing the beauty of music in a way where I'm helping other kids create it, teaching them on YouTube how to do it? What else can I do for both myself and for this, this world? What good can I use these talents for? And in an abstract way, yeah, it's this. <laughs> this phase, this body of artwork that I'm creating and producing is coming from within. Is sending me down paths to learn information and then learn more information even once I present it to you guys. Meaning, since I've posted that first Norb Theory video, I have learned a lot from you guys even in the comments section, throwing your two cents in some very detailed and beautiful knowledge and obviously going down other branches of information that this has led me down through other videos and other just knowledge paths. Some people meditate, some people pray, some people alter their consciousness with drugs or mind altering substances. Some people do very abstract things in life and do extreme things in life, again, to alter their states of consciousness, to feed consciousness, to feed experience. And for me, it's creativity. It's actually creating something to look at, to listen to, to, be, to pull an emotion or give an emotion from, hopefully positive ones. Also, in the search for duality versus monoism, 
good and evil presenting itself and deciphering between the two or only showing light, only showing positivity. I have a hard time with that. I think one is needed for the other to be appreciated. So not all of my bodies of work are rainbows, butterflies, unicorns, and perfect bliss only. There is hints of pain, of frustration, of creepiness maybe. And so in the previous video, I oversaturated it in any way I could to touch emotions, including some pain or some confusion or some anxiety, but I disclaimered it at least. Not everyone in life gives you disclaimers. I even learned recently, although it's not new, it's new to me for some reason, this whole 144,000 people, beings, souls, spirits that have been sent here that are all being activated now to help bring change. Apparently, our DNA is supposed to be reactivated. We are supposed to start re-remembering things. We are supposed to start receiving messages in various ways to disperse, decode, and spread. Some say heaven on earth. Some say we're moving out of our iron age of blindness and darkness. Some say it's the Palladians coming back to reawaken us, their cousins, whatever it is. Since discovering this, and doing my research, it seems everybody claims to be one of these 144,000. You know what's scary? It's not when you claim you're one. It's when others tell you you could be one. You're an indigo. You're way too talented for this planet. You're way ahead of your times. It's when you realize your whole life you've had all these extra skills and talents and things from within, and you don't know what the heck you're supposed to do with them. So you draw, you paint, you sculpt, you rap, you create stuff, you look for reactions, you look for paths. And then something like this shows itself. And I start thinking of all the times I ever heard you're special or you're gonna do great things or the, you have these talents for a specific purpose. You'll see, it'll make sense someday. It makes the hairs on my arm stand up. If my talents truly can help change and shape the world for the better, of course I'm in. Having said that though, it's like when you buy a new car. You don't realize how many Toyotas are on the road until you own one, right? So there's a biasness, I feel, of anyone that discovers this knowledge is like, hey, I'm one of the first to know this. I must be one of the 144,000. I'm not going to label myself as one. It's just interesting that I'm coming across this knowledge kind of after the fact. Also, a lot of this needs decoding, including the 144,000. I could be decoded into a bunch of other things, so I'm not looking too deep into it but I do think it's kind of trippy. And I am aware people are gonna take this as an opportunity to monetize, to misguide, to fill in blanks with conjecture and speculation without disclaiming it is such. So you yourselves, be careful when someone's claiming they're one of the 144,000 here to help you, especially if there's a buy now button, a subscription base, or ads all over the content and money is the agenda. You'll notice none of this stuff that I'm presenting is being monetized, and it's by design. It's not for money. I have some. My truest joy from my talents is not seeing my bank account. My truest joy in my talents and my art, my ex execution of my art, is actually seeing people's reactions. I even didn't know how infectious it would be to read the comments and see people's reactions. And then I got it like, like pinch myself and remind myself, hey, you're an artist, you just produced some art and people are enjoying it and reacting to it. That's what every artist does. We enjoy the reaction, that's why we did it. We did it to inform, educate, make you laugh, entertain you, give you knowledge, and hopefully get a good reaction out of you or whatever reaction we're hoping to get out of you. Not everyone wants good reactions. Not every artist is pure or comes from a good place or wants to show you Again, monoism versus duality. Some people stick to negative frequencies only by design, thinking that is their path to get to their enlightenment. So once again, thank you everybody very much for your interest. I'm flabbergasted to see that my subscribers kind of doubled. Never really was big on the, trying to get a big following on YouTube and do quantity of content all the time. But I think this is inspiring enough for me to continue down this path so if you like this please click the bell subscribe drop a comment drop some love some hate interact with me let me know if this is a path you guys want more exploration on and more art being produced from 
I think it's beautiful that a lot of people resonate with this on a uh, subconscious or a higher state of consciousness level. So thank you for that. This isn't a, yeah, so fuck the Globers and there's some more proof for you guys. Haha. -ha. This is just self-discovery being documented, art creating itself through vibrations and frequencies and oscillations. And I have been talking to Martin Kenny. Shout out to you, Martin. Uh, two conversations now that have both been very lengthy and beautiful and blissful. And we may well be doing some things in the future for you guys as a team. So look out for any clues of that happening. I don't want to give his next moves away, but he's got some great things coming up as well as far as dropping new knowledge. As I close this out, again, a very big thank you for listening. I know I talked a lot about myself in this video just to give you guys a bit of insight on who I am. And if you do watch future videos, you feel a bit of oneness with me. But this isn't about me, really. This is about you. This isn't for everyone. This message, these visuals, and I'm aware of that now. It's not for everyone. But if you're on this video, I do want to say to you, you're loved, you're special, you don't have fear, you do have intent, you do have purpose. And maybe for now it's just understanding and exploration and critical thinking and deprogramming. I love you. You love you. This universe loves you. And if you haven't yet, you're going to start today to live with intent. And if you don't know what your intent is just yet, you're going to start to find out as of today. I feel like my purpose is to actually awaken other creative types. So if you're on here and you are into music production, you draw, you paint, you do graphic design, you dance, you are an expressionist. You know how to encapsulate a moment or an emotion or a vision or a sound and express it through beauty. I think my message goes furthest with you guys to take what you're seeing and feeling and further express it in your own way to at least produce more beauty in this world. More love. I think that's going to be my slogan. More love. Anyway, thank you. I love you. thought we were fake, just a cartoon, just a made-up story. The truth is, you are nothing but slaves to your masters, and your masters are nothing but slaves to us in the second realm. You are there to mine the wealth of the land, because we cannot operate at your frequency. How do you think you got all this technology in the last 50 years? With no help? Yeah, right. Caught in the crossfire. It's caught in the crossfire.